that I had was 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 like a toxic breath coming out of a corpse. You see what I mean? Wouldn't be a pleasant thing, would it? No, no, no. no. Wouldn't be a pleasant thing to get in your face. But that is the correct analogy. You, you know, one of the problems with 9-11 and getting on past that most decisive event is that a great many people on this planet cannot face that anything could be so evil, that anything could have been done in such an evil manner. And what I am saying is that when you face that, the evil is already dead, but there will come out of it a kind of a toxic after, uh, after breath, and you're going to have to be really, really strong to look at it. Oh, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's I'm just imagining that last breath after death, right? When all that air comes out, um, and being that it is the face of evil, I can't imagine it having a pleasant smell whatsoever. So that's actually a, a whole different take on it. And very much appreciate it. Thank you, John. I, I hope that's helpful. The, the 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 operative word here would be, you know, corruption. You know, right. Uh, we know that there's there's a stink of corruption across this planet, yeah. an absolute stench of it. You know. Yeah. And yeah. when that giant monster of evil, whatever name or face we're going to put on it, and we mm -hmm. are going to put a face on it. We have to identify what is the ultimate threat to this experiment. When that topples like a giant and lies there, this breath of corruption is going to be heaved out of it. But the fantastic uh, lesson in that metaphor is that it's already dead. You know, right, right, it yeah, dying. it is dying. It is going down under the mm. mass of absurdity and horror of its own machinations. Yes, the absurdity of it. Yes, thank oh, you, John. Sure. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yes. And could I ask a quick follow up to that? Sure, so, Suzanne. Um, yes. Would that after breath be similar to us facing our collective shadow? I've had experiences where you know she can just take you to your knees, and and is it possible in that memory that we have a collective memory of that shadow and? that after gas is realizing our part in the story well oh boy yeah you know uh, our part you mean in the evil that's uh, yeah yes. folks <laughs> on this planet uh-huh yeah. so you would say that in some in the sense of your understanding or the understanding of some people that we all have a part in that evil. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, I would agree that we all have a part in that evil, but I would offer this uh, distinction that there's a great difference between having an active and a passive part. You see? Right. So the active part is held by human beings who are actually deliberately, deceptively, and systematically perpetrating that evil. The passive part is in our inability to recognize psychopathic behavior, in our inability to accept that people could actually be that evil. It's more or less in our, in our ignorance and in the default of our perception is the passive part. You see? Right. right. So if you make that distinction, I'm willing to allow that we all do have some, you know, we all are party to the evil in some respect. But I do not uh, uh, accept the Jungian proposition that uh, when you see evil, you're actually seeing a reflection of something in yourself. I don't accept that. Right. And so, but being that when you um, maybe realize your passive part and there's right. this big, 
big gasp, like, oh my gosh, I participated, I had no idea I participated, but I did. And then yeah. there's a giant retraction from the collective. Right. Could that, could that be a piece of her memory that we all spontaneously remember at once and creates who knows what in that moment? Uh, it's possible. I don't know. We'll find out in the spring because we <laughs> live through the experience uh, at the time when the perigee, the apogee of the moon actually transits in front of this head of this constellation. Mm -hmm. So what I'm proposing to the people in the crew, as some of you know, because you're in the crew, is let's do this fantastic imaginative experiment together. Let's focus our minds on a riddle. What is the ultimate threat to the divine experiment here? You know, what is the ultimate source of this terror? This phantom terror, what is it? Because, you know, there's real terror in the phantom terror, isn't there? Mm. Yeah. We know that terror is a hoax, don't we? We've learned this lesson in the last 10 years. But look at the real terror and murder that is committed within that hoax, right? Right. We've got to see to the core of this. And what I'm suggesting is that no one person alone can sustain that vision. But if we anticipate it together and use the framework of this astronomical mythology to direct our attention to it, we can see it together and we can, ho and we can take the blow. And it's going to be a sickening lurch, but it's going to be a lurch into freedom, the ultimate freedom, the freedom to be what this is really about and not to be, not to be deceived yeah. anymore. That will be a beautiful day. It will be. There are some mm -hmm. beautiful days in the journey of the living eternity. A good many of them, in fact. I was just... <laughs> End endless, right? <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for indulging well, me. You're welcome. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, Uranus Rising. We are speaking with John Lash. Please support him by visiting his website, metahistory.org, where you can peruse many of the topics John speaks of in addition to the subject matter we are covering this evening. And Lolly is next. Hi, John. It's good to speak with you again. Yes. Very good. Hello. Um, you recently interviewed with Dr. Judy Wood regarding 9-11. It was an unusual du duet with a rich discussion. Dr. Wood's approach was to focus only on the evidence without the bias of who is to blame, and both of you emphasize that we now have indisputable evidence of free energy. Her approach seems to exemplify the principles of the wisdom goddess, things that you speak about first and second attention, as well as love of truth and rigorous observation wrapped in a philosophy of live and let live. Would it be fair to say that the correction now upon us requires such rigor on every level from each of us? Uh, I would say it would be quite fair to say that and also an excellent challenge uh, to put it in those words, in those terms. Uh, as you probably uh, would know, uh, I consider the event of 9-11 to be a riddle and a tremendous challenge for our species. Something happened on that day which we have yet to understand. Uh, and Dr. Judy Wood has done what no one else has done, as far as I can tell, on the entire planet. She used, as a scientist and a trained chemist and an expert in interferometry, <laughs> used her first attention to go and look at the evidence. And that's what the first attention is for, you know? She did the detective work that no one else has done at the crime scene. Now, every detective has to do what I described previously. They have to be able to uh, free up the chiral lock so that they can use the first and second attention in coordination so that they can each use them independently, but also they can coordinate them. Uh, how does that apply to 9-11? Well, Dr. Judy Wood used the first attention, that is a capacity for observation and linear, linear logical thinking, 
to reach a conclusion of what was done on that day and how it was done. But, as you said, she focused only on the evidence of what was done and the beauty and the importance of her argument, uh, which is not a theory, but is, a, is, a, is, is an argument for the truth, is that it does not contain any indication of who is to blame. Now, if you want to go into the who is who did it and why part of 9-11, then you have to go to the second attention. In essence, you have to build up a story or a plot that fits the evidence you've examined with the first attention. So what Dr. Wood's work has done is open the door because she has solved the first part of the riddle, has now opened the door to go further, to break out of the psyops of 9-11, and ultimately to construct a story, not a theory, not a conspiracy theory, but an actual plausible plot that explains who did it and why. And this is a great challenge. We really need to do this because uh, I don't know if I would call directed energy weapons, uh, you know, the ultimate threat to life on this planet, but it's about as close as I'd care to get. Right. Well, you, you talked about continuing your work in deconstructing the psyops and, and, right. and developing that narrative. Have you, since that interview, have you... Um, uh, worked on that further? Yes, I've been looking at that closely, and it's my intention uh, in the course of this month to put out, and it will be posted on telestai, T E L E S T A I dot org, uh, two or three uh, short uh, talks. They will run maybe to 35 minutes each. I don't want them to be too long. 35 to 40 minutes each, uh, in which, and, and three should be enough, in which I will uh, uh, set out a practice, actually. I'm not going to present another conspiracy theory. I'm not going to overload people with my opinions of what happened. No. I'm going to demonstrate a practice of looking at the evidence and building a plot based on the evidence that can lead out of the psyops. And so that's my intention, at least. And uh, if all goes well, that will be on the site this month. Good. So it'll be also um, a method for deconstructing um, not just 9-11, but perhaps any other, um, the wider psyops in general, or any other one that's, that, that might come along. Cliff is seeing something in his data that it looks like something bigger than 9-11 is coming on the horizon. So, so having uh, instruction on how to do that would be very helpful. Well, yes, and I must say, uh, not any, in any respect in the sense of, of, uh, of prophecy or of doom, uh, doomsday uh, outlook, but I must say that in my understanding of that event, uh, the attacks of 9-11, the physical attacks, were... Uh, part of an assault, and that assault isn't completed yet. So they were the first part of an assault, and the second part, or follow-up to that assault, is due to, to come, and I don't think you have to be Nostradamus uh, to have a sense that this is on the way, but I want to point out that this is coming from human beings. It's not coming from outer space, not coming from ETs, not coming from anything supernatural. It's coming from the predators in our own midst. And so it's uh, now that correction is underway for the human species, there are certain things that Sophia can do. This comes up in some later questions. Uh, I think you've, you've set out for me. Uh, 